London is an ancient city. There have been people living, working on this spot for 2,000 years since it was established by the Romans. And at its heart is the River Thames. It's its reason for being. But today it's also its greatest source of archaeology. There are things on these mud banks that can tell us about this city's past. And I'm going to meet an expert now, and together we're going to do some mudlarking. Hello there. Hey, Dan. Good to meet you. Good to meet you too. The legend of the mud, the mud flats. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, this is great, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? Beautiful day. It's a beautiful day, and your dad. So when the tide goes out, you come down here. Why? I come down here to find history. Uh, the tides go out twice every 24 hours, and then you get access to the riverbed, and uh, you can find uh, lost and discarded history. Two thousand years worth of lost and discarded history. We, we just climbed down some steps. I mean, can anyone do this? Anyone can do it. You need a permit. I assume you've got your permit. Yes, of course. Good, good. You need a permit from the Port of London Authority. Once you've got your permit, anyone can come down here. The, the, the area that we're searching today, we're not allowed to disturb anything. We can only pick things up off the surface. So why is there anything on the surface? Why doesn't it just get swept out to sea or picked up by mudlarkers like you? you do you find stuff? Uh, there's lots of reasons. I mean, the river what has been a major highway. It's brought in trade. Things have been lost and dropped and dumped. It was a big rubbish dump for as long as the uh, city's been around. And also rivers in their natural, um, in, in, in their natural way are V-shaped. And what they've done here is they've built them up to create a flat platform for barges to rest on. And what they used to build them up was rubbish. So what's oh. happening now is it's eroding. And you can see all these revetments, these old wooden revetments. Uh, these are Victorian and Georgian. They're all starting to break up and the river's getting in, it's returning it back into that V-shape. So what it's washing out is domestic waste and it's scattering it across the foreshore and we find different things on every tide. Sorry to ask the boring question, but what's the most exciting thing you've ever found here? Oh gosh. Um, most exciting thing on this particular spot, this particular area. Uh, well, my favorite, favorite find all round is uh, a child's leather shoe oh. um, that, that dates back 500 years. It's, it's a Tudor shoe. I didn't find it here, but it's absolutely perfect condition. Um, I have found the ivory end of a, a sword scabbard uh, that once belonged to a Roman auxiliary soldier. So that's probably my, my, my favorite find from round here. Extraordinary. Yeah, it's incredible the things you find. Right. Well, can I have a go? Of course, yeah. Right, what are we looking for? Tell me. Ah, well, we're looking for areas where it's eroding. Yeah. Um, we're looking for patches of sand. We're looking for little patches where um, small metal objects are washing up. The river sorts by size and weight. So once you find an area where there's lots of small metal objects, that's where you find the pins and the coins and the little metal things. And we're also just generally looking for anything that looks unusual and out of place, straight lines and perfect circles. Okay. Um, are you allowed to, do you, do you take this home? Or, or do you go to the London Museum of London? What, what happens with these finds? Well, under, under the terms of your permit, you have to report anything of um, that's an old piece of sewer pipe. Sewer pipe? Yeah. That's my um, first ever find yes. on the Thames, a bit well of done. sewer pipe. Bit of sewer pipe. Do you know what? You, you, you're not the first. The things that people pick up first are welding rods and sewer pipes. Oh, okay. Well, they I'm always come to me with to welding rods and sewer pipes. Don't tell me. Sewer pipe. That's not a sewer pipe, no. Yes. That's a piece of stoneware. Um, that could have some age to it, actually. Um, it's hard to tell, there's not much of it, but you can see it's partly glazed, partly not glazed, and I'd say that could be post-medieval. Post-medieval. Well, I'm an 18th century, so I'm happy Are with you? that. Yeah. Yes, that's the best I period. I think we're about bang on then with ah, that. What a joy. Yeah. And you, get, you learn to read the foreshore, and you, you watch the foreshore change, and, um, and, it, and it can change overnight, or it can stay the same for months. So if you're coming down regularly, you, you just learn the places where it's good to go. Uh, and, and look, so... Uh, oh, there, and there's a bit of pottery. A bit there's of pottery a, there. There we go. Yeah. That's glazed, is, it, so that's, is that more modern, do you think? Well, that's really hard because it's, it's redware, and redware is quite common. It was made right through from medieval times through to Victorian times. This is probably a couple of hundred years old, okay. maybe 18th century again. Wow! I see, that, see that's, my, that's my sweet spot.
So what, what would be your perfect find today then, Dan? My perfect find, I'm very, I haven't got very high expectations. I'd be very satisfied with an Iron Age uh, ornate uh, shield or, <laughs> or, or perhaps a, a Viking long sword. Okay, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> what are the, some of the more unusual finds? Coins, um, wow. fairly yeah. unusual if you're searching by eye. Um, sometimes Roman hairpins, Roman game counters, beads are nice to find. Um, and of course the oldest things we find are fossils um, that date back, you know, hundreds of years. Sometimes you find worked flints, but I mean, I'm not great at identifying them, but sometimes they, they just stand out amongst all these other flints. So that's obviously pre-Roman, in fact, Stone Age, so you might Stone find... Uh, Mesolithic, Neolithic, wow. yeah. Okay. What, a, what a slice through history. It is, I mean, it goes back through, you know, 2,000 years. Okay, here we go, here we go. This feels 19th century to me, but I may be wrong. Yes, blue it is. China. Yeah, yeah, transfer wear, blue China. Um, it could be part of the willow pattern from the, from the outside. That's the most common pattern that you find, but it could be anything. It's hard to tell, but yeah, Victorian, late Victorian, early, early 20th okay, century. Well, that's all right. um, I can see a little bit of clay pipe stem yes, there. Yes, I've just seen it. Yeah, yeah shall I get it up? <clears throat> I mean, when you look, they're actually everywhere. There's another bit here. There's a bit by your boot. So um, these are these are really common so, because so they're the cigarette butt ends of the of the early modern period, the medieval period. Well, you know, it's a bit of a, a bit of a fallacy actually that um, that that people smoked them once and then threw them away. Okay. Um, they didn't, you know, our ancestors weren't wasteful. They'd smoke them. They broke very easily, and they'd smoke them until they got too short for a cool smoke, and then they became nose warmers, and then they probably got rid of them. But you know, there's so many because everybody smoked. You everybody know, smoked it was good tobacco, for you. yeah. And it was fashionable. Um, it was the cool thing to do. So they're everywhere. So, so far, no breakthroughs that are helping us reinterpret the city's past. No. It's a nice thing to do, isn't it? You're on the river bank. It's just, it's, even if you come great. away with nothing, it's just a beautiful thing to do. Now, is this a bone? It is, Ooh, yes. Now, what's that mean? Well, this is not probably an animal bone. Um, you'll find them everywhere on the foreshore, great piles of them, because the, the, the river was a dump, so people threw their domestic waste into the river. This one's been smashed up maybe to get the marrow out of it. Okay. Um, so it's just it's just domestic waste. Um, a lot of people think it's it's human remains and it's not. I mean there might be a few human bones mixed up with it but um, mostly it's animal bones from you know the glue factory butchers and it's what the original mudlarks were looking for, bones. They collected bones to take to the glue factory. They made money out of them. The original mudlarks? Yeah so the, so the um, Today, modern mudlarks, we're people who, we just do it for a hobby out of interest. Um, back in Victorian times and before, um, the mudlarks really were the lowest of the low. There were people scraping a living just one step away from the workhouses. And they'd come down here and it was mainly women and old people and children who really couldn't do much else. And they'd scrape around for anything they could collect to sell to, to make a few pennies just to get by. So they picked up bones and lumps of coal, and if they were lucky, they might find a copper nail or a tool that one of the shipbuilders had dropped. Um, and that's how they managed to make this pathetic living for themselves, but they were the lowest of the low. The very first time the mudlarks were mentioned, uh, written about, was by a man called Patrick Calhoun. And he was the man who um, established the river police uh, at the end of the 18th century. And um, he wrote about the mudlarks as well as all these other criminal gangs that were preying on the West India ships that were sitting at anchor out in the river waiting to unload, sometimes for up to six months. And while they sat there, they, their cargoes of spices and rum and sugar were being preyed on by scuffle hunters and um, river pirates and night horsemen. And the mudlarks were the ones that were poking around in the mud at the bottom and they received the packages of spices and the bladders of rum and took them to the taverns at, at uh, Rotherhithe and Wapping to be conveyed on into the... Uh, black market. So night horsemen, river pirates, scuff what? Scuffle hunters. Scuffle hunters. They Those had great the names. Coolest names yes, ever. I know. You're in a great tradition. Oh, yes. And then of course they were the Toshers and they were the uh, the mudlarks that also went up into the sewers. And they oh. went into the network of sewers under London, searching for anything that had dropped down there and got caught up um, between the bricks. And they made a better living actually than the mudlarks. They were usually men, um, and they were quite healthy men. Um, uh, Mayhew wrote about them in quite a lot of detail. And they, they hunted in gangs because it was quite dangerous under there. They could be overcome by fumes and attacked by rats and drown in the slurry. Um, but they found some good stuff and they made a good living. 
Most of them drank it away, though, I think, in the pubs. But must have a pretty good immune system. Yes, a very good immune system. So this is a pretty good place to search okay. here. Okay. So you can see there's, uh, there's uh, stones and they end and then it becomes um, sand. So this okay. is uh, a place where you might find something. I can see a little bit of 20th century glass around, which we're not yeah. super excited by. Oyster shells. Oyster shells. Oyster shells. Now, are these oyster shells from oysters that lived here, or from oyster beds that used to be here, or from people eating oysters and tossing them into the river? They are all from um, domestic waste, people eating oh, oysters. Right. Yeah, um, oysters don't live this far up. They live out in the estuary, and um, the estuary is very famous for its oysters, but if you if you look at them, they're mostly they're the native oysters. Yeah. The curly ones that you get in the um, uh, restaurants these days, they were introduced in the 1920s, oh, yeah. after these had been killed off basically by pollution. Um, and uh, so, th so these are the flat native ones, and these could date back 2,000 years. You know, the, the Romans, we were, we were famous here for our oysters, and the Romans would pack them into barrels with brine and send them off into the, uh, into the empire. So, you know, the Romans were eating them, and obviously the Victorians, you could get free for a penny, and it was protein for the poor. I love the idea of people here in the square mile eating their oysters and tossing them into the river and then we find it years later. Yes. So exciting. Yeah. I'll pick up this bit of coal. Oh, yeah. bit of coal? How cool. Bit of coal. So, but, they, so the original mudlarks would have been looking for things like yeah. this. Um, it would have dropped Coffee off from a collier. Newcastle. Coal from Newcastle, yeah, down from the northeast, probably yeah. on colliers. Captain Cook cut his teeth on those colliers. Yeah. <laughs> so that could have been off his ship. It could have been, yeah. I mean, the, the river would have been filled with them, yeah. you know, fueling the industrialising city. And the mudlarks were looking for this. There was um, a famous mudlark called Peggy Jones, who mudlarked up at um, Blackfriars on this side of the river. And um, she was written about um, going into the river up to her waist and feeling around for the coals with her oh, feet right. and the colliers would sometimes feel sorry for her and drop a lump or two in and she'd, she'd, she'd gather up as much as she could, she'd wash it, uh, take it up and, and sell it and, and, and buy gin with it and then she was seen staggering around the streets half cut uh, before she retired to her miserable lodgings in Chick Lane and then one day poor old Peggy Jones just disappeared and uh, nobody knows what happened to her, maybe she was washed away and she's still in the river, who knows. Hang on, there's a bit of pipe, pipe down here. Ah. Is that, oh, look, it's beautiful. It's got little, what do you call those little markings? Milling, it's milled around milling. the top. It's yeah. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, you, you date pipes by the size. So okay. the smaller they are, the older they are. The very oh, smallest ones I date from around 1580. Oh, that's quite small. Um, that that's quite small. That's mid 1600s, probably. It would have been around during the Great Fire of London, which of no. course raged through this part of London. If we'd been standing here 300 years ago, we'd have had our eyebrow singed, burnt wow. off. Yeah. This could have been during the Great Fire, thrown into the river. Who knows? Yeah. That's very exciting. The great Samuel Pepys. Yes. Yeah. That's the same age as Pepys. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Love that. Right. What else have we got oh, here? This looks so, like good. We have a good look around here, this would be a good area to look in. Right, so here we've got um, a button. Oh, look! Little fly oh, button. Eagle eyes! <laughs> Little fly button. So, how, how so old that is that? So, that would be uh, late 19th century. It's a fly or suspender button. Sometimes they've got the name of the tailor written around it, and usually from, they're uh, from the East End. So, they're quite nice to research. Lovely. You can research them right back to whoever made the, the clothes they fell off. Um, then, if we Okay, right. Okay, so we need to kneel down here. So, if we look very carefully around here, I can see just here. What? Is that how did you spot that? Okay. What? There's a handmade pin. That is ridiculous. You are superhuman. So each one of those is made by hand and they date from between 1400 and about 1800 when the process was mechanised. Um, and they would have drawn the wire to gauge, cut it to length, wrapped another piece of rye around the top a couple of times and soldered it and then polished and sharpened each one by hand. <laughs> this is a good spot. Where you find one, you usually find more. Is that one there? Uh, yes. I think it might oh. be. Yeah, there you go. Well done. Yeah. I'm very pleased with myself. That's very good. And where the pins are, that's where you find the other small metal objects. You can see lots and lots of blobs of lead here. So it's all washed together. Um, and there's a, there's a lace aglet 
it's the hard bits on the end of the laces that help you to lace your oh, yeah. shoes. But when people were lacing themselves into bodices and lacing up their cod pieces and their jerkins, um, <laughs> as well as the pins, they had laces. And on the end of the laces were these handmade little tubes of metal that were either riveted in place or sewn onto the end of the uh, of the laces. Do you ever find anything that you don't know what it is? All the time. Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> you do find quite a lot of these. So, um, you know, I know what these are. But, yeah, I'm always finding things I don't know what they are. Oh, that's nice. What's that? Something I don't know what it is, but it's got a stamp with a crown on it. Ooh, this is exciting. That could be part of a... Is it lead? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's lead. So it's part of a... Probably a cloth seal. So they would... Uh, woolen cloth had to come up to certain standards and they had to pay taxes on it. And so lead seals were attached to the bolts of uh, woolen cloth with um, the stamps of the dyers and the cloth makers. And uh, you do find them around here, so that's quite a nice one. That's fantastic. Oh, so that's, that's one of my favourites so far. There you go. We're in a good spot now. So do you, that would, do you that ever would be not eight. find anything? No. I always come home with something, even if it's just a few pins. You know, it's sort of... You always come home with something. I like... To, uh, it's a good day if I come home with something I don't know what it is. And then I've got, uh, got something to research when I get home. Okay, so let's have an update. What have you found? Okay, so I picked this up just because I really like roof tiles. I know that's a bit weird, but this has got a hole in it for the wooden peg, but it's burnt. So Hold where on. do you think that might come Hold from? Hold on. Are we looking? This is Great Fire of London action. You never know. You just what? don't know. I mean, it comes from before the Great Fire of London, when after then they started to nail them on and the holes become smaller. And, it and it's burnt. burnt. It's broken and it's burnt. So, Great Fire of London? Yeah, it could be. You know, maybe they did throw some of the rubble over here and onto the foreshore and that, that could be part. Uh, what else have we got in here? There we go. Put that away. Right. We what? have got part of Ooh, a that's face. That's lovely. So that's, that's 16th or 17th nice. century German stoneware bottle called a Bellamine. Um, and they had these beautiful beardy faces on them. Yeah, there's a nose and a bit and, of beard, and beard there. And the yeah. beard would have come down over right. the belly of the, these little stoneware pot belly bottles. And uh, they came from Germany. And um, the, the, the beardy man is actually the wild man of, of folklore, a bit like the green man. but. Um, because he was said to look like a Catholic cardinal called Cardinal Bellamene, um, and it was around during a time of religious turmoil, it's said that the Protestants like to smash these bottles okay. to see his face in pieces, that's very which is, is why there's lots of bits of them. But I don't know; that's probably an urban myth. Okay. So I think we felt quite a lot today, especially someone who's been on archaeological digs and <laughs> whole days go by the thing. Is this a normal day? A good day? It's a pretty average day. Average day. Yeah, and yeah. No wonder people like mudlarking. You're yeah, guaranteed. Finds. If you know where, to, if you know what you're looking for, um, it's, a lot of it's, vision like you. A lot of it's practice. I mean, it, I've been doing it nearly 20 years, 15, 20 years, and uh, you know, you, you get you get your eye in. Um, so someone coming down on the off chance, sort of first time round, probably wouldn't find this much stuff. But once you've been doing it for a while, you start to see things. Right. Let's let's head through these posts. <laughs> I just love being down here amidst these sort of skeletal outlines of, of Georgian and Victorian piers. I think they're amazing. It is. It's a magical place. It really is. Especially on a day like this. Yeah. Ah! What you got? Coin. Well, don't be silly. Coin. A coin? Coin. Do you want to pick Where? it up or should I pick it up? Well, you found it. You pick okay. it up. You're joking. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, that's a big coin. It's a big one. What? what is it? Oh, oh my goodness. It's, George, it's George II. George II. Has it got a date on it? But that's Britannia, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Britannia with her shield. Yeah. That is too Can exciting for words. The there you go. Well, I didn't George, think we'd find one today, but we have. Georgius two. two. Is it two Rex? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that is cool. And there's it, there he is with his wreath, like his Roman, in his Roman outfit, somewhat bizarrely. Yeah. Oh my god, that's exciting. Yeah, good one. You hero! Yes. Amazing. That has just made my day. Made my day too. <laughs> oh. oh, 
I've walked these streets like millions of other people. I've crossed this river a hundred times. I've been on boats up and down this river. I have never realized that I was passing by a treasure trove of archaeological material. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. And it's addictive. I can guarantee you. I'm worried about that. It's addictive. <laughs>